Hey, good morning everybody. We're back to do a reading of Lecture 4 of Rosicrucian Wisdom by Rudolf Steiner. Lecture 4 is called A Descent to a New Birth. And real quick, I want to uh, just talk about kind of what my vision here is, what my goal is with this channel. As many of you have probably seen, I started off doing like political commentary, but I've been really interested in the esoteric stuff for quite some time now. Pretty much started researching both around the same time, and they do interconnect. Um, so really what I want to do is, with these first two Steiner readings that I'm doing, the, the first one was an esoteric cosmology. This one is Rosicrucian Wisdom. And this, I think, will just kind of lay out kind of a foundation for what's to come on this channel. So, I understand that a lot of what Steiner talks about, he's assuming people kind of know more than probably what they do, in a sense. And also, um, you know, I, I want to get into more of the explanations. Steiner does have a lot of explanations. Of like symbolism and whatnot but it's scattered throughout his works and it's kind of taken for granted that the student understands that stuff already see I st when I started I started studying the symbolism first which may or may not have been the best way here on this channel we're kind of doing it the reverse way where the whole thing is laid out the whole esoteric understanding of the lore and whatnot is being laid out in these first two works by Steiner then I want to get into okay once those statements are made now let's go and investigate the Bible and the writings which show that what Steiner is talking about is actually what's in the Bible that's that's where I want to take this so we're going to get the overview from Steiner in these first two books that I'm reading then I'm going to jump into Probably some Manly P. Hall, Max Heindel, where they get a little bit deeper and show you what Steiner is saying in these books is actually in the Bible. And it is the understanding that the writers of the Bible had. So whether you believe what Steiner is saying or not about like astral bodies and elemental bodies and all this, whether you personally believe that or not, that's kind of aside from the point. The point is that that stuff that Steiner's talking about is what's in the Bible and in all these other sacred scriptures of the world. That is what they're talking about. So that's that really can't even be debated. I mean, sure, it can be, but when you really dig in, you're going to see that is what they're talking about in the Bible. So now it's up to you whether or not you believe that these things are a reality that can be debated. That's fine, but that's where we're going to go here. And then eventually, as I said, you know, my channel started off somewhat political. Now, I'm neither side, right? I, I realize there's corruption on both sides. So that's what my goal is, to show how this esoteric information is practical. We can use it in real life, and the battles are going on all around you. And, you know, once you wake up, you realize, wow, this is actually happening all around me on many different levels. So anyway, we'll see how that goes. I don't want to talk too much here. So let's just jump into lecture four, Descent to a New Birth. <clears throat> in the last lecture, we described the region and worlds through which human beings have to pass after death when everything that binds them to their physical instrument has been laid aside in Kamaloka or as one says in Rosicrucian, as one says in Rosicrucian wisdom, the elemental world. We spoke of Rupa Devakan, or the region known as the heaven world, the world of inspiration. We heard that this region, the spiritual land proper, has a fourfold constitution, like the physical world. There is the continental region, permeated by the flowing oceanic region, which is more aptly to be compared with the blood circulation in the human organism. 
in the surrounding air of Devakan, which is analogous to the atmosphere of our earth, is to be found all that pervades the souls of beings in the physical world in the way of joys, sufferings, sorrows, and afflictions. Only that air must be conceived in a much wider sense, because that world is the dwelling place of other quite different beings who are not incarnate in physical bodies. Finally, we heard how in the fourth region of Devakan, everything that is truly original from the most ordinary idea to the most lofty inspiration of the inventor or artist exists as an archetype. In that world lies the motive force of the progress of our earth. But in addition to those constituent realms of the spiritual world proper, we find what it is that links our earth with still higher worlds. Up to now, we have been considering things that have reference only to earth evolution, not those that transcend this evolution. Someone who attains initiation acquires knowledge of what our earth was in the past and will be in the future, of what links the earth with worlds beyond our system. Important above all in Devakan, in that world of reason, is the Akashic Record, as we are accustomed to call it. The Akashic Record is not actually brought into being in Devakan, but in an even higher region. However, when the seer has risen to the world of Devakan, he can begin to perceive what is known as the Akashic Record. What is the Akashic Record? We can form the truest conception of it by realizing that whatever comes to pass on our earth makes a lasting impression upon certain delicate essences, an impression which can be discovered by a seer who has attained initiation. It is not an ordinary, but a living record. Suppose a human being lived in the first century after Christ. What he thought, felt, and willed in those days, what passed into deeds, this is not obliterated, but preserved in this delicate essence. The seer can behold it not as though recorded in a history book, but as it actually happened. How an individual moved, what he did, a journey he took. It can all be seen in those spiritual pictures. The impulses of will, the feelings, the thoughts can also be seen. But we, no, we must not imagine that those pictures are impressions made by physical personalities. That is not the case, as we can see from a simple example. When we move a hand, our will pervades the moving hand, and it is this force of will which is hidden here that can be seen in the Akashic Record. What is spiritually active in us and has flowed into the physical is seen there in the spiritual. Suppose, for example, we look for Caesar. We can follow all his undertakings, but let us be quite clear that it is rather his thoughts that we see in the Akashic Record. When he set out to do something, we will see the whole sequence of decisions of the, of the will to the point where the deed was actually performed. To observe a specific event in the Akashic Record is not easy. We must help ourselves by linking on to external knowledge. If the seer is trying to observe some action of Caesar and takes an historical date as a point of focus, the result will come more easily. Historical dates are, it is true, often unreliable, but they are sometimes of assistance. Looking for Caesar with the eyes of the seer, we actually see the person of Caesar in action, phantom-like, as though he were there before us, speaking to us. But if someone capable of having a few visions looks into the past, various things might happen to him if he has not entirely found his bearings in the higher worlds. The Akashic Record is to be found in Devakan, but it extends downwards into the astral world, with the result 
that in this lower world, the pictures of the Akashic record may often be like a mirage. They are often disconnected and unreliable, and it is important to remember that when we set about investigating the past. Let me say that again. The Akashic record is to be found in Devakan, but it extends downwards into the astral world, with the result that in this lower world, the pictures of the Akashic record may often be like a mirage. They are often disconnected and unreliable, and it is important to remember this when we set about investigating the past. Let me indicate the danger of these possible mistakes by an example. If the indications of the Akashic record lead us back to the epoch in the Earth's evolution when Atlantis was still in existence, before the Great Flood, we can follow the happenings and conditions of life in old Atlantis. These were repeated later on, but in a different form. In northern Germany, in central Europe, eastward of Atlantis, long before the Christian era and long before Christianity made its way there from the south, happenings took place which were a repetition of conditions in Atlantis. Not until after this, through influences coming from the south, did the people begin to lead a life that was really their own. Here is an example of how easy it is to be prone to error. Someone observing the astral pictures of the Akashic record, not the Devakonic pictures, may be confused in regard to these repetitions of Atlantean conditions. This was actually the case in the indications about Atlantis given by Scott Elliott. They tally with the astral pictures but not with the Devakonic pictures of the true Akashic record. We cannot avoid stating the truth about this matter at some point. The moment we know where the source of the errors lies, it is easy to assess the indications correctly. Another source of error may arise when reliance is placed upon indications given by mediums. When mediums are possessed of the necessary faculties, they can see the Akashic record, although, in most cases, only its reflections in the astral. There is something singular about the Akashic record. If we discover some person there, he behaves like a living being. If we find Goethe, for example, he may not only answer in the words which he actually spoke in his life, but he gives answer in the Gertian sense. He may even utter in his own style verses he never actually wrote. The Akashic picture is so alive that it is like a force working on it. <clears throat> Let me say that again. The Akashic picture is so alive that it is like a force working on in the way that human being worked. Working on in the way that human being worked. Hence, the picture can become confused with the individuality himself. Mediums believe that they are in contact with the dead person whose life is contained, whose life is containing, er, continuing in the spirit, whereas in reality it is only his Akasha picture. The spirit of Caesar may already have reincarnated on earth, and it is his Akasha picture that gives the answers in seances. It is not the individuality of Caesar, but only the enduring impression which the picture of Caesar has left behind in the Akashic record. This is the basis of errors in very many spiritual seances. We must distinguish between what remains of the human being in his Akasha picture and what continues to evolve as the true individuality. These are matters of extreme importance. And to interject here, that is why people like Manly P. Hall, people like Steiner, true initiates of the Rosicrucian path like these guys, Heindel, you know, you'll get it from all of them. They say, don't mess around with trying to be a medium or doing seances and whatnot like that. It's You're going to do yourself uh, some damage to the psyche is really what's going to come out of that. So, anyway. 
When human beings have passed out of Kamaloka, they have weaned themselves off all the habits for which a physical instrument is necessary. They enter into the region described above. The period that now begins for them is exceedingly important, and we must understand what it is that happens. Everything that they have merely thought or felt, all their passions, confront them in Devakan in the forms of things surrounding them. Firstly, they see their own physical body in its archetypal form. Just as here on earth they walk over rocks, mountains, and stones, so in Devakan they walk over the archetypes of all the structures that exist in the physical world. Thus, they also walk over their own physical body there. One characteristic of human beings after death is that their own physical body is an object outside them. This is how they can tell that they have moved up from Kamaloka to Devakan. On earth, we say to our body, this is me. In Devakan, we see our body and say, that is you. Vedantic philosophy teaches its pupils to meditate upon that is you, so that through such exercises they may understand what it means to say to the body, that is you. In Devakan, we also see around us all that we have experienced inwardly here on earth. If we have harbored revenge, antipathy, or other evil feelings towards our fellow human beings on earth, these confront us from outside like a cloud, and this teaches us what significance and effect all these things have in the world. Let us be clear about what happens to human beings in Devakan. How have our organs, for example, our eyes, been formed? There was a time when no eyes existed. The eye has been formed out of the physical organization by light. Light is the progenitor of the eye. What is around us on the earth creates organs in physical bodies and substances. In Devakan, what is around us works upon our being of soul. So everything we have developed here on earth in the way of good or reprehensible feelings is to be found in our environment in Devakan. It works upon our soul and thus creates organs of the soul. If we have lived a righteous life on earth, our good qualities live around us in the air of Devakan. They work in the spiritual realm, creating organs. These organs serve as architects and molders for the, for the building of the physical body in a new incarnation. What was within the human beings on earth is transferred to the outer world in Devakan and prepares the forces that build up the human body for the next birth. But let it not be imagined that human beings have nothing to do except to care for themselves. In addition to this, they have other very important work to do in Devakan. We can form an idea of this if we consider a brief period in the evolution of the earth. How greatly certain regions have changed during the course of a few thousand years. There were once quite different plants, different animal forms, even the climate was different. In respect of the products of nature, the earth's surface is continually changing. What once grew on the soil of ancient Greece, for example, could not emerge again now. Evolution proceeds precisely through the fact that the face of the earth undergoes constant change. When human beings die, a very long period elapses before they are born again. I'll read that again. When human beings die, a very long period elapses before they are born again, so that when they appear once more on the earth, they find quite new conditions. They have to have new experiences. They are not born a second time into the same configuration of the earth. They remain in the spiritual world until the earth has entirely new conditions to offer them. There is good purpose for this. For they, are there, for they thereby learn something entirely new, and their development moves forward quite differently. Think of a Roman boy. His life did not in the least resemble that of a modern schoolboy, and when we ourselves are born again, we, in turn, 
shall find quite different conditions. In this way, evolution proceeds from incarnation to incarnation. While human beings dwell in the spiritual regions described, the face of the earth is perpetually changing. What beings are active in this? By what beings are the changes in the earth's physi, physi, uh, physiognomy, I believe? We'll read that again. What beings are active in this? By what beings are the changes in the earth's physiognomy brought about? This brings us at once to the question, what do human beings do in the period between death and a new birth? They work from the spiritual worlds under the guidance of higher beings to transform the earth. It is human beings themselves between death and rebirth who carry out this work. When they are born again, they find the face of the earth changed, changed into a form which they themselves have helped to fashion. All of us have been engaged in this work. Where is Devakan? Where is the spiritual world? It is all around us, all the time. It truly is. Around us, also, are the souls of discarnate human beings. They are at work around us. While we are building cities and machines, human beings who are living between death and a new birth are around us, working out the spiritual realms. Working out of the spiritual realms. When, as seers, we seek for the dead, we can find them within the light, if we perceive the light not merely in a material way. The light that surrounds us forms the bodies of the dead. They have bodies woven out of light. The light that enfolds the earth is substance for the beings who are living in Devakan. A plant nourished by the sunlight receives into itself not the physical light alone, but also the activity of spiritual beings, among whom there are also these human souls. These souls themselves ray down upon the plants as light, weaving as spiritual beings around the plants. Looking at the plants with the eye of spirit, we can say, the plant rejoices at the influence coming from the dead who are working and weaving around in the light. When we observe how the vegetation on the face of the earth changes and ask how this comes about, the answer is, the souls of the dead are at work in the light that envelops the earth. This is where Devakan actually is. After the period of Kamaloka, we pass into this realm of light. This is a concrete fact. Only those who are able to point to where the dead are actually to be found have any knowledge of Devakan in the sense of Rosicrucian wisdom. When the faculties of the seer develop, he often makes a striking discovery. As he stands in the sunlight, his body impedes the light so that he casts a shadow. Very often he will discover the spirit for the first time when he looks into this shadow. The body impedes the light, but not the spirit. In the shadow that is cast by the body, the spirit can be discovered. That is why more primitive peoples, who have always possessed some measure of clairvoyance, have also called the soul the shadow. They say, shadowless, soulless. Adelbert Chamiso's novella is unconsciously based on the same idea. The man who has lost his shadow has also lost his soul, hence his despair. Such, then, is the work that is performed by human beings in Devakan between death and a new birth. They are by no means in a state of inactive repose. They work creatively from Devakan at the evolution of the earth and thus we are able to understand how the world evolves. They are not, as is often said, in a state of blissful rest or dream. Life in Devakan is just as full of activity as life on earth. <clears throat> when human beings reach the moment when they have transformed into spiritual forces, 
their activities in their last earthly life, when these experiences have come to them from the outer world of Devakan and have worked upon them, then they are ready to come down from Devakan to a new birth. The earth once more attracts them to its sphere. The first thing they encounter on their way down from Devakan is the astral region, the elemental world in Rosicrucian terminology. This world gives them their new astral body. If iron filings are scattered on a piece of paper and a magnet is moved about underneath this, the filings arrange themselves into shapes and lines, following the magnetic forces. In exactly the same way, irregularly distributed astral substance is attracted and arranged according to the forces that are in the soul and correspond with what this soul has achieved in the previous life. Thus, human beings themselves assemble their astral body. These human beings in the making, who initially have only an astral body, appear to the eye of the seer like bell shapes opening downwards. They shoot and whirl through the astral world at a tremendous speed, a speed that can hardly be conceived. These incipient human beings next need to obtain an ether body and a physical body. Up to this point, the stage of the formation of the astral body, the process depended upon themselves, upon the forces they themselves have developed. But the forming of the ether body does not, in the present phase of evolution, depend upon the human being alone. In order to form an ether body, human beings depend upon other beings external to themselves. Consequently, although the astral body is always a perfect fit, there is not in every case perfect accordance between astral body and the ether and physical bodies. This is often the case, this is often the cause, rather, of disharmony and lack of satisfaction in life. These incipient human beings whirl around space, as they do because they are seeking for suitable parents parents who will afford them the best opportunity of receiving an ether and physical nature that fits their astral being. The parents who provide this can only be relatively the best and most suitable. Cooperating in this search are beings who attach the ether body to the astral body and who are similar to those often called folk spirits. Such spirits are not the intangible ab abstraction they are usually considered to be. A folk spirit is as real to the eye of the seer or our soul that is incarnate in our body. A whole people, although it does not have a common physical body, has a common astral body, and rudiments of a common ether body. The people, as a whole, lives within a kind of astral cloud, and this is the body of the folk spirit. Such bodies guide the ether formations around the human being, who is thus no longer entirely under his own control. Now comes a moment of extreme importance equally as important as the moment after death when the whole of the past life is seen as a memory picture. When human beings pass into their ether body but have not yet acquired their physical body, it is a brief moment but of supreme importance. They have a prevision of their coming life, not in all its details, but only as a survey over what this future life has in store for them. Although they forget this at the moment of physical incorporation, they can realize that they are about to embark on a happy or unhappy life. If an individual has had many unfortunate experiences in the previous life, it may now happen that he gets a shock and is hesitant to enter into the physical body. The result of this may be that he does not come right down into the physical body, and so the connection between the various bodies is not fully established. This can produce idiocy in the coming life, 
It is not always the cause of idiocy, but frequently it is so. It is as though the soul were resisting incarnation into the physical body. Such a human being cannot make proper use of his brain because he is not correctly incarnated in it. He can only use his physical instrument aright when he allows himself to be born into it in the full and proper sense. Whereas, in other circumstances, the ether body extends only slightly beyond the physical. In the case of idiocy, portions of the ether body are often to be seen as an etheric sheen extending far beyond the head. Here is a case where something that is left unexplained by physical observation of life can be explained through spiritual science. <clears throat> and that concludes this lecture. And if we think about, you know, some of the some of the things that are being pushed today or some of the so-called problems we have in society, you know, with obviously there's a big push for, you know, transgender rights really really pushing it and, and like indoctrinating children with all this now i don't want to talk too much about this but i mean it's easy to see when you look at it from a higher standpoint how these malfunctions occur and yes i said malfunction because it is an aberration it is not the normal flow of things for someone to be transgender or gay but that's not a knock on those people i'm not putting those people down i think they should be respected and they should have just as many human rights as you know anyone else um but it's been politicized it's been pushed on people and they're indoctrinating people for their own benefit for their own agendas so you know there's usually a middle ground within all these you know, popular debates, and it's not just black or white, so anyway, keep an open mind, and uh, we'll be back next time with the next lecture, be sure to share, like, subscribe, do all that stuff, and uh, yep, we'll talk to you later, thanks again guys, take care.